Good afternoon and welcome to the Federalist Society discussion on the role of attorneys in the war on terror. I am Dean Reuter, Vice President and Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. I thank you all for being here today. Uh, today's program is sponsored by one of our 15 Federalist Society practice groups, the International and National Security Law Practice Group. And we're joined today by three expert panelists. Happy to welcome them as well. I'll introduce them in the order in which they're going to make opening remarks. We're going to hear those opening remarks, uh, followed then, uh, those will be eight to ten minutes each for each person, uh, followed by some general discussion, then followed by questions from you, the audience. So be thinking of your questions as we go along. Uh, we're going to begin with Deckert law firm partner Stephen Bradbury. At Deckert, he practices complex commercial litigation, securities enforcement, and antitrust and competition matters. In the Bush administration, importantly, he was head of the Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, most of you probably know that's the office that provides legal advice to the President, to the Attorney General, and to all the departments uh, of the executive branch on all the difficult constitutional and statutory legal questions. And he's going to speak to us initially, at least, about the role of the government lawyer in the war on terror. Uh, sitting to his left is Professor Stephen Vladek. Uh, professor Vladek is a professor at American University Washington College of Law here in town where his teaching focuses on, among other things, constitutional law, national security law, and international criminal law. And he himself is guilty of repeat appearances at Federal Society events, so <laughs> certainly thank him for being here today. He was part of the legal team that challenged the use of military commissions by the Bush administration, and he'll be speaking initially about the role of private lawyers in the war on terror. Sitting to his left, left is Nitsana Darshan Leitner. She comes to us all the way from Israel, where she is director and founder of the Israel Law Center, which is leading the struggle to fight Islamic terrorist organizations in the courtroom. She represents hundreds of terror victims in lawsuits against Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, the PLO, nation states, and others. She's going to be speaking to us initially about her experiences at the Israeli Law Center. And with that, Stephen Bradbury, the podium is yours for eight to ten minutes. Thanks, Stephen. I'm sure you'll hold me to it. You bet. You should have mentioned that one of Nitsana's defendants is Hillary Clinton and the, and the State Department. Hamas, Hezbollah, and the State Department. There's <laughs> <laughs> a, nice, a nice ring to it, I guess. Um, as, uh, I know the title of the program is Private Lawyers, the role of private lawyers, and as Dean mentioned, uh, I don't really do a lot of this kind of law, war on terror related law in private practice, but I was in a senior position at the Justice Department and transitioned out of that into private practice, and that's kind of my perspective. Um, and I, I think that uh, if you think about it, issues, policy issues that arise in the war on terror or other national security issues, almost any issue these days uh, in Washington, have always have a major legal component. And so getting legal advice within the government, f supporting whatever the government is doing or conditioning it or restricting it, is critical, absolutely essential element of any action the United States may take. So uh, it's critical for the president to get a uh, authoritative view within the executive branch of what the law requires. And so the president will do that through the Attorney General, a senior uh, official usually at the Office of Legal Counsel uh, in the Justice Department to assist the President, the military, the intelligence community, etc. And those, those officials who give that advice by, by the nature of things, the way things work in Washington, are always going to be political appointees. Uh, they have to, the, the President is always President and Attorney General are always going to want to choose who their senior legal advisors are. They want to have confidence in that person. The person is part of the team in a significant respect in any administration. And that person has to be able to meet with the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor, the heads of the intelligence community in the Situation Room at the White House and tell them, no, you can't do what you want to do, or here are the restrictions or legal impediments to what you want to do. And uh, the government does not put career lawyers in that position. So we're talking about political appointees, and by nature of political appointees, they transition in and out of government as administrations change. And uh, that's what I want to focus on today in some brief uh, remarks. And I, I want to focus first on the transition out of government into private practice and make 
two, two quick points. One relates to what I think is everybody recognizes or certainly has been apparent since 9-11 and even before that, and that is the politicization of the legal advisor role in the federal government. Uh, as I said, any significant national security action the United States may take usually generates controversy, always has an essential legal element to it. So there's always going to be some legal analysis and usually uh, if it's a controversial or unprecedented action, there's going to be controversy or disagreement about the legal basis for something. It's, we see it in the current administration, we saw it in the last administration, it's nothing new. But increasingly, that's become the focus, that legal analysis of the political debate on Capitol Hill or between the branches in the media becomes highly politicized. And there's a lot of pressure for disclosure uh, of the legal analysis and pressure on the lawyers who give the legal advice. And uh, I think it is essential for the executive branch when it takes action to explain the legal basis for its action and to come up to Congress, lay it out. That's a tradition and something we should expect and uh, it is critical for our democracy. But the exposure of the actual legal advice, the confidential opinions that are given, has a real downside. And I think uh, it should be uh, well recognized. It sort of the same principle that relates to attorney-client privilege. We want legal advisors to have confidence that they can give the most candid uh, unvarnished legal advice and weigh the downsides of potential action as well as the upsides. And when we expose it and it becomes a subject of political debate, it's corrosive of that principle and very, very hard to get that unvarnished legal advice. And I think we all lose uh, as a result of that. It weakens the ability of the government to act and it uh, puts at risk the uh, some of the pillars of the of our democracy because for any branch of government to act it has to have the confidence that it can get that internal confidential candid legal advice so we see uh, as a result of debates and disagreements over the Bush administration's positions on war on terror etc that some of the legal opinions that were written particularly early on in the administration uh, and a few later in the administration, uh, became uh, hotly contested. There were disclosures and the opinions became the subject of debate. And then those lawyers, uh, particularly once they transitioned back into private life, became the personal targets of some of this vitriol, some of this, uh, uh, d these disagreements. And so you saw uh, legal challenges brought, claims, Bivens action against uh, John Yu, who was the author of some controversial opinions, claiming that his opinions led to actions that caused injury to someone down the chain. Ultimately, the Ninth Circuit dismissed that on qualified immunity grounds, but the principle there was, well, the issues were novel, they were not clearly established norms. Of course, then the next time around, someone will claim, well, now they are clearly established, and so we can challenge them and impose personal liability on the lawyers who gave the advice. So you can only imagine how that will affect the willingness of future senior officials who are going into government for a temporary period and then hope to come out and uh, reestablish a private practice later, their willingness to give that candid advice, or their willingness to go into the details uh, of the tricky issues uh, that uh, are required to support uh, a full and complete opinion on some of, on some of these issues. So uh, I think last point on this issue is it so often comes down to a disagreement about the legal reasoning or the outcome of the legal opinion. Basically a disagreement about the or it's really a disagreement about the ultimate policy. And sometimes uh, statements are made that, oh, no reasonable person would uh, take that position or reach that conclusion. But often that's made by folks who are unwilling to issue their own opinions on the same subject because to do so would be necessarily to recognize that there are gray areas and these issues are difficult ones. Uh, so instead, it's a reflexive, almost political response. Oh, nobody would do that. It's an easy question. But of course, it's usually not uh, an easy question. And often, it's one thing to say lawyers who give advice need to meet 
professional ethical standards, and that's certainly true. But sometimes the, the uh, investigation or inquiry into those ethical standards or professional standards is really colored by a simple disagreement about the bottom line policy or the, the, the reasoning. Second point I want to make about lawyers transitioning out goes to an ethical issue, and that is lawyers in the government represent the United States. That's their client. They have, as they leave government and go back into private practice, they continue to have a professional obligation, a duty to maintain the confidences of that client uh, that they represented. But so often we see, particularly in this age of quote unquote transparency, where everybody wants to tell their story, everybody wants to reveal what happened and their perspective on things, that lawyers who transition out often don't recognize that they have that continuing professional obligation and uh, in fact spill the beans in terms of internal uh, debate deliberations over a hotly contested legal issue. And of course we should recognize and accept and in fact embrace the fact that there's disagreement among officials internally on difficult issues. Uh, and while we all want to see what the wizard's up to behind the curtain, uh, or we enjoy, you know, the titillating details of the clash of egos or the disagreement among senior policymakers in an administration, particularly if it's an administration of the other party. Uh, nevertheless, that again, that kind of exposure has corrosive uh, effects on the future ability of lawyers to give advice, the future ability of presidents to get unvarnished uh, legal advice. So uh, I just wanted to make that point. One quick point before I close uh, about the ethical obligations going the other way of attorneys in private practice who may come into uh, positions in the federal government. Uh, they too have ethical obligations with respect to lawyer, with respect to clients that they represented in private practice and whether there are uh, uh, conflicts with the position of the United States and activities or issues they may get involved with, legal advice they may give uh, to the government when the United States becomes their client and they, they enter into a government uh, position. And in particular, where there are particular matters involving specific parties, there is an ethical obligation lawyers have. You can't switch sides. You can't represent a party on one side in a particular matter involving specific parties and then flip over and represent a party on the other side without getting the mutual consent of both your former client and your new client and informing them of that. And uh, we saw this issue arise in connection with private lawyers who represented uh, detainees at uh, Guantanamo uh, who then moved into positions at the Justice Department and the question was raised whether they were involved in working, representing the government, advising the government, representing it in connection with that uh, litigation involving uh, some of those detainees. And some of those detainees are alleged to have participated in a conspiracy together. So it's one, it's really one matter. This was an issue that has been written about by uh, Richard Painter and Ed Williamson who raised these issues. And I'm not questioning by any means the patriotism or integrity of the lawyers who represent the detainees in, in private uh, litigation against the United, in civil litigation against the United States, habeas, what have you. Uh, I think that's part of the great tradition of lawyers in Washington to represent unpopular parties and, uh, and points of view. I'm just raising the, uh, the issue about the uh, ethical obligations that continue with a private lawyer going into into government. So with that, Dean, I'm sure I'm way over my time and I'll close. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Professor Vladek. Great. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean, for the invitation. Uh, it's always a treat to uh, get to speak before the Federal Society. Uh, oftentimes it's on issues where uh, I think going in I know exactly how much I disagree with many of my friends in the Federal Society. Here actually I think it's a little more complicated, so that's refreshing. Um, the, uh, my sort of task today is to sort of pick up where Steve left off and talk about the role of private attorneys um, in the war on terrorism. And I thought I'd start with two contemporary vignettes, uh, two recent episodes that I think might help set the stage for uh, the rest of my remarks. So the first is the oral argument 
uh, at the end of October in the Supreme Court in Clapper versus Amnesty International. Uh, many of you are familiar with this case, but just in case you're not, uh, this is a challenge to the constitutionality of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act Amendments Act of 2008, right, the FISA Amendments, um, which dramatically expanded the government's power to conduct warrantless foreign intelligence surveillance, um, indeed to do so without any real judicial supervision at all, so long as the target of the surveillance was a non-citizen outside the territorial United States. Now, a bunch of uh, lawyers, human rights groups, and journalists, uh, and one, I think, Icelandic parliamentarian, uh, brought suit challenging the constitutionality of these amendments, um, and the central question was, do these plaintiffs have standing? Uh, do the lawyers, have, among others, have standing? Their claim is that they have taken steps that have actually cost money um, to communicate with their clients, with witnesses, with other folks overseas in a manner that would not be subject to interception under the FISA Amendments Act. Uh, and then the question before the court is, is that enough to generate uh, Article Three standing? The Federal Court of Appeals in New York, the Second Circuit, said yes. Um, three nothing in the panel, then it divided 6-6 six, six on bonk. This went to the Supreme Court. Um, and I suspect I don't have to tell people in this room uh, just what the current court thinks of hypothetical standing claims. Um, and yet, uh, one of the, I think, telling moments in the oral argument came about halfway in to the government's presentation, uh, where Justice Kennedy, rather than asking a question, uh, said the following. He said, I think the ethics problem is a very substantial one. I think the lawyer would engage in malpractice if he talked on the telephone with some of these clients, given this statute. Right? Let me just re underscore, that was Justice Kennedy. Um, now, whatever that says about the merits uh, of how this case is going to come out, and I think it says quite a lot, um, I think the larger point is that it helps to underscore the increasingly central role that private lawyers have come to play not just in challenging governmental counterterrorism policies, but actually sometimes being on the receiving end of those policies, right, as in the case of surveillance uh, and warrantless uh, communications interceptions, um, right? So it's become so much trickier to be a lawyer representing these kinds of clients uh, since September 11th because of the government's formidable powers, um, right, in, in investigating these kinds of cases. So that's vignette number one. Uh, vignette number two, the decision by Chief Judge uh, Royce Lamberth here in the D.C. District Court uh, in September about the continuing right of detainees at Guantanamo uh, to access to counsel even after they've lost their habeas petition. Uh, so the government had uh, handed down a new memorandum of understanding, uh, the MOU, um, that at least based on some way, a plausible reading of which would have dramatically restricted uh, the ability of detainee counsel to confer with their clients uh, to bring new filings in court once that uh, detainee had had one round of litigation uh, in the D.C. courts. Uh, and the lawyers uh, challenged the new MOU on the ground that it violated the existing protective order that Judge Lambert had uh, put in place to govern the Guantanamo habeas cases. Uh, and Judge Lambert agreed um, and basically said that the MOU could not be enforced. Um, and this is what he wrote. He said, quote, the court has an obligation to assure that those seeking to challenge their executive detention by petitioning for habeas relief have adequate, effective, and meaningful access to the courts. In the case of Guantanamo detainees, access to the courts means nothing without access to counsel, and it is undisputed that petitioners here have a continuing right to seek habeas relief. It follows, Judge Lambert concluded, that petitioners have an ongoing right to access the courts and necessarily to consult with counsel. And so, right, the implication here is the judicial recognition of the critical role private attorneys have played in the detainee cases, without whom the right of access to the courts recognized in Boumediene would be meaningless. Right, so here are two very recent episodes where two different judges, um, neither of whom are necessarily particularly sympathetic to the plaintiffs in these cases, um, are going out of their way to recognize the unique burdens and the unique responsibilities that private attorneys face in these cases. So although these judges get it, um, I think it's safe to say that has not always been so. Um, right, so many of you are probably familiar with remarks uh, made in January 2007 by the then Deputy Assistant Secretary for Detainee Affairs at DOD, uh, right, in which he said that I think quite honestly when corporate CEOs see that those firms are representing the very terrorists who hit their bottom line back in 2001, they're going to make those firms choose between representing terrorists or representing reputable firms, and I think that it's going to have major play in the next few weeks, and we want to watch that play out, right? The insinuation being that uh, law firms could not see uh, 
as part of their obligation, as part of their responsibility, representing both corporate America and individuals being held at Guantanamo. Uh, more recently, Steve already alluded to this, uh, there was the Al-Qaeda 7 video put out by the Keep America Safe group. Uh, right? This was a video that questioned, well, the patriotism, among other things, um, of a number of lawyers who had worked on the detainee cases and who had then gone into the Justice Department uh, during the Obama administration. Um, and indeed, Washington Post columnist Mark Thiessen uh, argued shortly after the video came out that, quote, the habeas lawyers were not doing their constitutional duty to defend unpopular defendants. They were using the federal courts as a tool to undermine our military's ability to keep dangerous enemy combatants off the battlefield in a time of war. Um, now, the Al-Qaeda 7 episode, the uh, big firm uh, episode, I think those both produced backlashes, uh, right, including backlashes from folks who are in the, uh, that, were, that were joined by folks in this room, um, and I think that's laudable, but I think it shows that there is still this continuing tension right, between the courts, who I think have consistently understood the significant role that counsel play in these cases, and at least some members of the public. Um, anyway, there's a lot more to say, uh, but I thought I would just sort of um, wrap this up and, and stay in my eight-minute uh, window um, with four points that hopefully might segue us into more of a discussion later. Uh, so the first point, I think it's safe to say, and I think we can say this now 11 years into these uh, lawsuits, private attorneys have been instrumental in ensuring that our counterterrorism policies adhere to the rule of law. If anything, the tireless work of private attorneys in these cases, I'm a little biased, but you know, um, have added an air of legitimacy to the results especially where the government has nevertheless prevailed that would not otherwise have been possible, right? That is to say, as hostile as we might be to the idea of zealous representation on behalf of those who would seek to do harm to the country, that's the only way we can be sure that justice is being done, right? If at the end of the day they've had their day in court, they've had the best representation, and they're still found to be detainable, guilty of their crimes, etc. Second, private attorneys have expanded countless millions of hours the vast majority of which have been pro bono, representing unpopular clients in these cases. Third, as the Clapper case suggests, private attorneys themselves have increasingly become the subjects of governmental counterterrorism policies and not just the advocates challenging them. And fourth and finally, because of these three observations, those who continue to criticize or otherwise attack the role of and work of private attorneys in representing terrorism suspects are necessarily attacking not just the lawyers, but the more general and fundamental principle that ours is a government of laws and not of men. Thank you. Hi, well, I'm glad I came from Israel because we don't have these problems of uh, representing the uh, terrorists. We are actually suing them. <laughs> these are the bad guys with us. We don't have a conflict, we don't have uh, ethic problems, and we are, millions of hours are put into uh, combating terrorism and not encouraging them. Um, I'm the uh, head of Shoradadin Israel Law Center. It's a civil rights organization based in Tel Aviv that in the past 12 years has been suing terror organizations, state-sponsored terrorism banks that are providing financial services to terror organizations, <coughs> helping the government and helping the IDF to combat terrorism. Now, there is no question that in Israel, who's standing in the front line of fighting terrorism, the security services are doing anything they can to uh, target the terrorists. The intelligence agencies are doing uh, in putting a lot of efforts to uh, uh, go after the perpetrators of the uh, terrorists. However, the Israeli government has some constraints, have some problems, they have to be politically correct, they have foreign relationships, they have international treaties that are signed off, and they cannot do what private lawyers can do. They cannot sue the organization, they cannot sue states, sponsor terrorism, they cannot go after banks legally, they have other ways to go after the bank, which we'll get into it too. Um, but this is the role that uh, we as private lawyers decided we can take in the war against terrorism. And I will illustrate it in a couple of uh, cases. Um, I think one of the major cases that, that was brought against the banking system was a case against the Arab Bank, 
that the bank that um, ran a reward program in favor of the families of the suicide bombers during the Intifada. Um, if you were a father or a mother of a suicide bomber, if you were a child of a suicide bomber, you could have gone to the Hamas headquarters in Gaza, get a letter from them saying that you are a relative of a suicide bomber, take the letter to the bank, uh, to the branch of the Arab Bank in Gaza, show it to the bank manager, and again, the bank manager will give you a reward of many thousands of dollars. This policy continued, uh, could have continued until today, unless the Arab Bank had a branch in New York, and therefore there was personal jurisdiction over the bank. Uh, a lawsuit was brought against the bank on behalf of uh, families of terror victims from Hamas who were injured and killed during the Intifada. And um, that caused not only the uh, Arab Bank to change the way they were doing businesses, but it sent a shockwave through international banking system that no bank agrees anymore to provide financial services to organizations. And every bank that wanted to open a bank account for an Islamic charity made sure that this charity is not identified with any organization. In addition to this, no bank agrees anymore to uh, open banks, open branches, or operating in terror zones like Gaza. There is no banking system in Gaza anymore. This is why you see them smuggling money into Gaza through the tunnels in suitcases. And we all know that this is a major problem for the terror organizations because they need to bring hundreds of millions of dollars into the Gaza Strip. They need it not only for the missiles who cost a lot of money, especially if you smuggle them into Gaza and you have to bribe a lot of Bedouin and a lot of people along the way from, from $1,000 and may turn to $10,000 per missile, but they need it for the uh, population. They needed to provide the population with free food, free education, free medical services in order to gain back their loyalty, to continue shooting missiles towards Israel from their backyards. They also need it for the military. Yes, they do have soldiers, they don't wear uniforms, but they have people who are on standby and waiting for the day to be called to carry out attacks inside Israel. And until this day, they are on salaries. They get paycheck one month after month after month. And this requires hundreds of millions of dollars that terror organizations cannot bring any longer to Gaza. I was told that as a result of these lawsuits, terror, uh, money diverted to terrorism in Gaza reduced in 60%. Another angle, these cases are helping the government, in this case the Israeli government, is um, they actually compel banks to close down accounts. We have a case against Bank of China that decided that despite all the warnings from the Israeli government, he's not closing any accounts that belong to the organization. He had a bank account for a Hamas a terrorist who was sitting in Beijing and receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars from the headquarters of Hamas in Syria. And once the money was hitting his account, he was sending it to his brother, another Hamas terrorist in Gaza. When the counter-terrorism division of the Israeli government met with the Treasury of China, met with officials of the Central Bank of China, and asked them to close down the account, the Chinese said that Hamas is not a terror organization in China, and they have no intention to, call, to close the account. So we enter the picture. We filed a lawsuit against Bank of China in New York because the money was going through the Bank of China in New York. It was wire transactions in dollars. Um, and um, on behalf of uh, victims that were killed or injured by the missile attacks of Hamas during the Intifada, and a month later, the bank closed down the account. And to illustrate another thing is that these cases are actually the long arm of, um, of the law going after banks that don't have branches in the United States because many banks feel very free if they don't have branches in the United States, if they have no personal jurisdiction here in the United States, they can operate, they can deliver money, they can transfer money to terrorists without problems. And um, we just won a a significant victory against a bank that thought that he can do 
anything he wants to because he doesn't have branches in the United States. This is the case against Lebanese Canadian Bank, a Lebanese bank that uh, decided to be the uh, banker of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hezbollah in Lebanon acted under two foundations, one called Yusser Foundation, the other called Martyr Foundation. And this was a major, major bank for Hezbollah. We um, filed a lawsuit against Lebanese Canadian Bank and also against the American Correspondent Bank of Lebanese Canadian Bank because all the wires were in dollars. It was the American Express Bank. We filed it on behalf of terror victims that were killed or injured by the missile attacks of Hezbollah in the Second Lebanese War in Israel. And um, American Express Bank came and said that they had no way to know that the uh, money was provided to Hezbollah. Quite surprising because the account says Mar Martyr Foundation. Uh, and Lebanese, but they won. Lebanese Canadian Bank came and said that uh, they don't have branches in the United States, they have no activity in the United States, they have no presence in the United States, and they lost it to be withdrawn. Um, we say that um, because Lebanese Canadian Bank did this wire transaction through an American correspondent bank, through the American Express Bank, uh, there is personal jurisdiction over the bank, and uh, we won. We um, actually, the one who wrote the brief is Mayor Katz, one of our lawyers here. Um, and that, and, and, and the court significantly said that even though the bank don't have presence himself in the United States, still the uh, long arm status can put him under the jurisdiction of the United States. Um, really. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so quickly. Cases against state sponsored terrorism. We have losses against Iran, against Syria, against North Korea, and the question comes always so how do you collect it? Because it's very nice to have the judgments. How do you even affect these countries who have billions of dollars? So cases against Iran, in the beginning we went after frozen Iranian assets in the United States, which was a target, an easy target. Um, then we started to be more creative. We found a house that belonged to the son of the Shah. Years ago the son of the Shah wanted to fly a plane and his father sent it to Lubbock, Texas, because they have a big Air Force base there, and bought him a house. After the Islamic Revolution the house became an Islamic uh, property, an Iranian property, and uh, we took our judgment, we went to the sheriff in Texas, Lubbock, gave him to the um, sheriff and the sheriff sold uh, for the sale of the house, gave us a million dollars towards the house. We also found, a, a, we read one time in the newspaper that uh, Iran is complaining to UNESCO that an artifact collection that they gave to the University of Chicago 30 years ago is still in the hands of the University of Chicago and they refused to give them back. So we immediately went to the court in Chicago and we say, filed a turnover proceeding saying that if Iran claims that the artifact collection belongs to them, we have a judgment against Iran, turn the collection to us. Um, also around the, st uh, the, uh, the ward, um, we got information that the National Oil Company of Iran has a bank account in Rome, which has half a billion dollars in it, so we immediately took our judgment against Iran, domesticated them in Rome, and asked for a, a lien on the money, and the uh, judge uh, issued a temporary restraining order called the parties we're hearing in front of him. And for the first time, Iran came to court. Not only them, they got the Vatican involved, they sent representatives to court, they got the ministry, foreign ministry of the Italian government involved, they sent lawyers to court, all the banks sent lawyers to court. There was like a saga of 20 lawyers standing there in court and screaming at the judge in Italian. Um, they said two things. They said that you cannot go after the assets of the National Oil Company to collect your judgment against Iran because they're not the same entities, they don't share the same assets. And obviously they came and say that they uh, notice that they get about the loss, it wasn't adequate. 20 lawyers were standing there in court and yet they claimed that. We brought an international, international law expert that testified that in regimes like Iran there is no difference between the government to the uh, oil company, national companies and you can indeed collect your judgment. We also claimed that the services you did to Iran was sufficient but the court who wanted to go on the safe side ordered us to re-serve Iran and in the meantime it took off the lien. One hour after it took off the lien Iran shifted away the money away from Rome to Thailand. So although we didn't get the money, we were told that Iran never went back to the Italian banks and put its money in Italy. 
So we did the same thing in France and Germany, and Iran immediately pulled its money away from the German and the French banks. And now we're just chasing after Iran from a place to a place, not letting them keep their money in a normal bank, meaning they cannot use the hard currency, cannot use the euro, cannot use the dollar. And in order to fund the Palestinian terror organization in Gaza, they ultimately need to use the euro, the dollars, or the shekel, which are the going currencies in Gaza. I have too many <laughs> stories, <laughs> uh, but maybe in the uh, questions and answer, um, our case against Ahmadinejad, a case against um, how we stop the uh, flotilla to Gaza, but I will leave it to uh, later on. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I do want to get to audience questions uh, as soon as we can, but before we do that, uh, I'm going to have a little discussion up here and at, at a minimum give uh, Steve Bradbury a chance to react to the statements of Stephen Vladek and, and Nitsana, and then maybe Steve Vladek a chance to react to Nitsana's statements and then on from there. But Steve Bradbury, a, a minute or two. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dean. Um, I guess I'll uh, address him in reverse order. Uh, Nitsana and then Steve. Um, first of all, with respect to Nitsana's comments, uh, I love the way she pronounces Hezbollah <laughs> <laughs> and Lubeck. But anyway, <laughs> I'd love to see a picture of you <laughs> in Lubeck. Um, anyway, uh, first of all, let, let me just say uh, I greatly admire your energy, your focus your drive, your organization, and totally share the, the goals uh, that, you are, uh, that you are pursuing. And um, it sounds like you've had some amazing results uh, going all around the world tr tracking the trails of some of these uh, organizations and, and foreign governments that support them. Um, as a former government lawyer, uh, I, I would just raise a reservation. And uh, that, that is that, as I'm sure you know better than anyone in, in the room, um, often the pursuit of these private interests uh, that relate to international relations, international actions among countries, and the actions of the government, including the government of the United States, will produce difficult and sad situations sometimes when they come up against the policy goals of a government, the, uh, the desire and need that the government has to maintain flexibility, uh, discretion in foreign policy uh, areas. And believe me, f speaking as a lawyer who worked on some of these issues at the Justice Department, uh, I have seen the desire that the State Department has to maintain uh, the flexibility uh, of our foreign policy positions and our ability to react to unfolding situations overseas. And so sometimes those, those private interests and those governmental interests in the international arena come into unavoidable conflict and, and often the, sometimes the result is a, is a sad one for the private interests. And uh, one example I would give, I don't think uh, you were involved or your organization was involved, but had to do with very legitimate and sympathetic claims that uh, U.S. citizens had against the former government, Saddam Hussein's government in Iraq for the injuries they suffered at the hands of the Iraqi government, uh, torture and other uh, abuse and persecution. And these were civil suits against the government of Iraq. And uh, of course, in 2003, we invaded Iraq, overturned Saddam Hussein, and, and worked to set up a new government in Iraq, which we very much supported, the United States did as a policy matter. Well, that new government of Iraq uh, succeeded to the, the, the liability or potential liability under these claims. And these lawsuits continued in courts in the United States. And it, uh, again, very sympathetic, uh, meritorious, uh, one has to think. Uh, but at the end of the day, the executive branch and Congress got together and passed uh, a reauthorization to the Defense Authorization Act that put an end to these suits and essentially gave immunity from them uh, to the new government in Iraq as a policy matter 
you know, it's a, it was a major ally of the United States and said we can't continue to operate or exist uh, in the way we hope to if these, uh, if these claims uh, were to proceed. So those are the types of issues that often result in these, in these areas. Um, just in response to, to Steve's points, uh, I guess I would, I would say I don't, one thing I would pretty strongly disagree with that Steve said is I don't think the Clapper case should suggest or does suggest that the government is targeting private attorneys uh, for surveillance or other government action uh, in the war on terror. Uh, I think the allegation there was that under the FISA Amendments Act, the surveillance at issue is focused on suspected terrorists who are overseas. And the notion is that the executive branch in conducting foreign intelligence surveillance should be able to target those overseas individuals to uh, uh, surveil their communications. Um, it's not targeting someone in the United States. It's not targeting the attorney. The concern was that the, the attorney may have occasion to communicate with those uh, suspected terrorists overseas and might have his or her communications and therefore confidential attorney-client communications uh, overheard. And a similar, similar issue with respect to access to detainees for habeas counsel. In both of these, both of these areas really are at the interface of the uh, war powers paradigm and the law enforcement paradigm where these two uh, come together. And uh, it's just the reality is the government is going to have a strong national security interest in uh, gathering and doing surveillance of communications of suspected terrorists and understanding where national security issues may arise from those communications, whether it be future attacks or whether it be the uh, disclosure of national security information. And uh, uh, it's not targeting the lawyers, it's not trying to interfere with the lawyer's ability to represent clients. And the two worlds need to be kept separate uh, to the extent necessary to preserve the right of the lawyer to represent the client, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a, an overlap and it's a necessary interface. So that's all I would, I would raise. Thanks. Steve Black, a couple minutes. Sure. Um, so let me just briefly, since Steve just, just sort of went there, let me, let me start with Steve. And, uh, um, so I, I tried very, very hard to specifically not say that the government was targeting lawyers under the FISA Amendments Act, and if I did, uh, I misspoke, because I was trying very hard to avoid that. The whole point of the FISA Amendments Act is that there's massive amounts of communications being swept up involving individuals who are not targeted, right? That's the entire point. So it wasn't as, mine was not a suggestion there's a specific agenda against lawyers. Um, but in the Guantanamo cases, I mean, the whole point of the MOU was to restrict the ability of lawyers to communicate with their clients was to give the government more access to the confidential communications between the clients and their uh, between the lawyers and their and their and their clients, and so I think you know I, I'm with you 100 percent on in the in the Clapper case it not being about the lawyers as such. I think in the Guantanamo cases it is, and I think that's exactly why Judge Lambert got so worked up. Um, and and I mean if you guys have ever seen Judge Lambert, you know when he gets his dander up. Um, you know what that looks like. Um, and, and, you know, the larger point, I think, right, is that it, the question is, are these cases like other cases, right? Should the normal rules that attach to attorney representation, the normal ethical obligations, the normal limitations on the government's ability to interfere with the attorney-client relationship, should those kick in? Um, my view is yes, right? Steve's view may very well be yes with exceptions. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's a worthwhile debate. But I don't think it should just be, you know, once you've had one shot in court, the government can now cut off the right of access to counsel that we've already said you have. Um, so that's just a, a short re reply on that. Uh, on Ashran's point, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know if, I, I don't know that, that we, there's much daylight between our views of the role of lawyers, right? I mean, Steve's, Steve's response was, was more about why some of these cases maybe should lose on the merits, right? But I don't think that, I don't think that any, anything that any of us said suggests that they shouldn't be brought if they might be viable, right? And so I think we have to be careful to differentiate between cases where we object to the substantive results that lawyers are trying to obtain and cases where we object to the fact that lawyers are doing anything at all. Um, right, and I think that's a very important distinction that we often blur in these kinds of conversations. To my mind, 
right? Lawyers should have the ability to bring non-frivolous claims to the fullest extent of the law, period, in both directions, right? Whether it's private suits against terrorist groups, private suits against former government officials, uh, which I suspect is where Steve and I differ, um, right? I have no problem with the lawyer bringing the suit. Uh, we can fight about what should happen once the piece of paper is filed, right? We can fight about whether the Ninth Circuit should have come out the way it did in Padilla versus you. Um, but I, you know, I guess I'm I'm troubled by comments like one that Miguel Estrada made after the Ninth Circuit dismissed the Padilla versus you suit that the entire lawsuit was frivolous, uh, right? I mean, I think if you go back and read the Ninth Circuit's opinion, there's a lot of analysis in there. Um, I've never seen that much analysis for a frivolous suit. Um, right, and so you know, I think we have to. If, if the if the question is what is the appropriate role of lawyers, I think the question cannot be who should have won that case, right? I think the question should be could that was it right? What was it was it right for the lawyers to bring that case in the first place? And I think there, there's very little daylight uh, between you and me. Okay, I'm so happy that um, we are just private organization, private lawyers. We don't have these restrictions. Um, but, uh, you know, when you're talking about the State Department, I think that they have to uh, simply um, stay away from uh, these cases. Um, I'm saying it because, um, first of all, we're suing the State Department. And I don't expect the State Department to be on our side at any time. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a suit we filed just last week. Um, um, the State Department, the State Department, going uh, giving the uh, Palestinian through U.S. aid uh, and directly close to uh, 500 million dollars a year, and uh, they're giving it uh, despite the fact that the Palestinian Authority is uh, giving this money to uh, terrorism. In the course of our litigation, we found out that first of all, the Palestinian Authority paying the uh, salaries of the Hamas officials in Gaza. They, uh, part of the budget is uh, funding the PLO, which constitutes the uh, uh, several organizations like Fatah, like, sorry for my head, Fatah, um, um, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which, is, which are all designated organizations in the United States and Israel. Mm -hmm. And um, they pay the salaries of the uh, uh, prisoners who took part in suicide bombings in Israel. Uh, pay their salaries, support their families. So a lot of the money uh, paid by the U.S. government is uh, going to support terrorism. Uh, and uh, we uh, filed a lawsuit on behalf of American citizens who live in Israel that don't want their uh, tax money going to uh, kill themselves. Um, but I tell you why I'm, I'm saying State Department should uh, stay away, because we had another case against the Palestinian Authority, which we um, um, won against them, and uh, in the beginning they ignored it because they thought that uh, we have no way to collect any judgment against them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Once they realize that we are uh, restraining uh, their ability to function in the United States, we got their f bank accounts frozen. We had a lot of uh, funds belong to them frozen. We tied up more than 200 million dollars that belong to the Palestinian Authority. They reached the State Department and ask them to uh, stop these cases. And uh, we had a problem because, um, you know, State Department can come into the case and shut the case down based on the state of interest. So we immediately launched a campaign against the State Department. We uh, got <laughs> senators, 10 senators and congressmen to write letters to the State Department. We brought 25 terror victims from Israel, United States, to meet with the, pers with the uh, State Department. And urged them for once to stand on the right of the terror victims and not to the right of the terror organizations. We told them that if you don't have guts to fight the terror organizations, don't stop us from doing it. And uh, the State Department uh, came to court, said that they are uh, not going to uh, intervene with the cases and uh, urged the party to settle these cases out of court. Um, so I believe that the, uh, the um, State Department should let, my point was that the State Department should let the terror victims or should let any American citizen uh, to utilize the laws that the Congress legislated, the Anti-Terrorism Act, the, uh, um, the um, exception for the Sovereign Immunity Act in the cases against Iran and against Iraq, uh, 
um, and uh, let them exercise their rights because they are entitled to compensations. If the Congress let them to do so, the State Department should not interfere. Very good. Uh, let's turn to the audience for questions. Uh, just indicate you have a question. Raising your hand, Richard Samp. We have a microphone. If you would wait for the microphone so we can get your question on the tape. Richard Samp with the Washington Legal Foundation. Our organization spends a lot of time uh, in court uh, opposing efforts to expand jurisdiction of the United States courts under both state common law and under the uh, uh, alien tort statute, whereby foreign plaintiffs and foreign defendants, foreign plaintiffs try to come into American courts and say these overseas activities are ones that uh, the American courts ought to have jurisdiction over. Uh, among the suits that we have been involved in are ones in which uh, Palestinian citizens have uh, uh, come into court and said Israeli government officials are terrorists and uh, they uh, ought to be held accountable under American law for their terrorism activity against us in Gaza. And it sounds as though some of the lawsuits you're bringing kind of push the envelope in terms of the jurisdiction of American courts. And I'm wondering if that's a concern to you that you perhaps are creating precedents occasionally that would allow uh, similar sorts of suits to be brought by Palestinians against Israeli government officials. Right, well, you know that the, uh, the um, law um, gives immunity to uh, Israeli officials, Israeli state, from being sued of this sort of uh, cases, as opposed to uh, Iranian officials, as opposed to um, uh, designated terror, uh, terror uh, states which are listed of the State Department uh, uh, watch list who specifically have no sovereign immunity in these sort of cases uh, due to the exception of the Sovereign Immunity Act. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, indeed it was, uh, uh, it, it is a concern always, always, um, but in the relationship between us and the Palestinians, um, they cannot bring these cases against uh, Israel, against Israelis. The, I'm sure you uh, relate to the case against Avi Dichter and, uh, and other officials. Um, and um, which the State Department, in this case, was okay, <laughs> came and, and stood the rights of the uh, Israeli officials. But they, they, they said it the law. They said that Israel has immunity. They cannot be sued, as opposed to a uh, other states. But I can tell you that in all our uh, uh, operation, I would say the Palestinians started. They did these cases first. Um, the um, civil cases for asking uh, compensations were brought by the Palestinians against Israeli way before we started our cases. It was in the first intifada. We're talking about the 80s, the early 90s. They brought cases for hundreds of millions of shekels against, uh, against Israel and won their cases. So we are just doing exactly what they did. Uh, same thing with the war crimes complaint. We know that the Palestinians are trying to indict Israeli soldiers and Israeli officials uh, for war crimes in uh, different uh, courts around the world that um, claim they have extraterritorial jurisdiction. And our cases against come as a counter a claim against them. So we are watching and scrutinize and being very, very careful, but all our actions so far are response to what they do. Steve Vladek or Steve Breber, you want to, anything to add here? Just one very, 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 very short thing, which is, uh, you know, Nishan's mentioning the, the sort of the extent to which the State Department can sometimes get in the way, right, in these lawsuits. What, what's really curious is there are also another set of cases where the executive branch doesn't oppose uh, uh, a, a private tort suit going forward, and the courts still are reluctant to, to entertain the suit. So uh, some of you may be familiar with the tort suits currently pending in Maryland and Virginia um, against various military contractors for the Abu Ghraib torture, um, right? There are a host of fairly respectable judges, including Judge Wilkinson, um, who would have said that federal common law, um, the, uh, specifically the need to protect foreign affairs, uh, displaces uh, the ability of these private litigants to proceed under state law, even though the Obama administration filed a brief in those cases saying we actually don't oppose tort liability in this case. Um, so, you know, I think there's an interesting question to ask not just about the role the executive branch should be playing in these cases, but whether the court should, you know, protect the executive branch even sometimes from itself. Steve Bradbury, anything? 
Uh, next question right here, sir. Paul Mirengoff, a question for Professor Bladek. Uh, I strongly agree that it was wrong to criticize uh, defense lawyers as unpatriotic for uh, defending uh, <coughs> detainees and so forth, but um, lawyers often get criticized for the clients that they represent. Uh, in the Wisconsin election, uh, Tommy Thompson was, was attacked systematically for his representations uh, while he was a lawyer uh, or a lobbyist here in Washington, D.C., and it seemed to have played a part in, in turning the tide against him. Do you have any, I can't remember how you stated your fourth principle in your closing, but do you have any problem with criticizing, not criticizing the patriotism, but simply criticizing the choices of lawyers who choose to defend uh, uh, terrorist or, or accused terrorists? I mean, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a loaded question a little bit, right? Um, I, I think, the, do I have any problem is, a, is I, I'll put it this way. Um, I think we have to be careful to differentiate between why we are being critical of lawyers, um, right? So um, there is the extreme case where the criticism is that lawyers are actually themselves facilitating the crimes of their clients, uh, right? Which I think hopefully we can all agree is something where it is not inappropriate to criticize lawyers for actively facilitating the crimes of their clients. Um, we have the other extreme, right, which is lawyers who are simply um, trying to vindicate their clients' rights, um, right, as uh, under existing law, right, in a way that is not, you know, facilitating anything other than their access to the judicial system. Um, you know, when lawyers sort of are doing other things, I think maybe they lose some of the protections that I think they should have, right? When lawyers are, are writing op-eds, um, right, or when lawyers are, are, you know, actively engaged in politics, I think we have to say what, it's, it's the function, not the title, um, right? So just a good example of this, there's a, um, a big dust up about six years ago um, when an Alabama Supreme Court justice um, uh, wrote an op-ed um, excoriating his colleagues for having the temerity to follow a Supreme Court decision, um, right? And, and, and a lot of people sort of jumped, jumped on the the justice, uh, Tom Parker, for writing this op-ed. Um, and to my mind, the, the relevant criticism shouldn't have been the content of this op-ed, but the forum, right? That, you know, as a state court judge, he has every right to write an opinion that says, I don't think I should have to follow the Supreme Court decision. But it's when you start writing, when, when judges cross the line and write op-eds, I think they, you know, they're starting to cause different problems. And the same for lawyers, right? So I think, you know, we have to be careful to differentiate between lawyers who are representing clients and doing so zealously and within the canon of, uh, of ethics um, and lawyers who are doing other things, and that's where I think you know that's where I think the conversation often doesn't doesn't sort of up follow that nuance. Thank you. Comment from one of the other panelists on this. Um, I may agree with you. That's okay. Just 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 <laughs> because just because we are civil rights organizations, so we should respect uh, uh, the right for uh, for counsel. However. Um, I believe that the lawyers that represent the uh, terrorists should be condemned for what they do, um, especially when they do it so zealously. Um, there is a difference if you uh, represent a terrorist and apologize about that. You know, I have um, a, a lawyer that represents the Palestinian Authority in Israel who comes and says, you know, Nitzana, I'm doing it for the money. I mean, he, he had the need to come and apologize for what he does, as opposed to lawyers who, um, in the positions, interrogate the terror victims like those rape victims that the lawyers come and say, didn't you dress provocatively, you know, like you order the terrorists to your house to kill yourself. Or why did you go to this bus station and went on this bus when you knew that buses can blow up in Israel or stuff like that? Um, when it comes to this point, I think the lawyers are, uh, should be condemned. Unfortunately, you can't seize them from representing the terrorists, but they should be uh, shamed. Can I, say, can I just jump back in on that? For, I mean, I, I, I think we have to be careful with the assertion that all of the defendants in all of these cases are terrorists, um, right? Now that, and let me just be crystal clear, right? I'm not saying anything about Iran, about Hamas, but I, I, right? That's, my point is about the cases I work on, right? Because the charge in those cases is that anyone who's at Guantanamo is 
ipso facto a terrorist, right? And part of what the lawyers are trying to do is to challenge that very labeling, um, right? And to actually try to vindicate their belief that at least some of these individuals, not all of them, but at least some of them were in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, right? And so I think, you know, we, we sort of start blurring very important distinctions when we just say lawyers shouldn't be representing terrorists. Um, right, because I think a lot of, in, in a lot of times, not in the cases that you're working on, but, but in the cases, but, it, but it, no, but in the cases that I work on, um, but, but no, but not, not in the, not in the cases that I'm working, but in the cases that I'm working on, right, a lot of times the exact question we're fighting about um, is are these in fact the people who, the, who, you know, who are entitled, who, who deserve that label. Steve Bradbury, anything on this? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't disagree with anything Steve has said. Question in the back. Um, this, this question for uh, Mr. Vladek. Um, and following up on what you just said, you closed your principal remarks by asking the question whether we would prefer to be governed under the rule of law or governed by men, which I think is a question that answers itself for anyone who desires to live in a free society. My question is, um, are there any circumstances in a time of uh, war where, and if so, what would be the principal basis for making the distinction, where um, a captured combatant is not entitled to uh, counsel, and is it just, you know, the difference between wearing a uniform or not wearing a uniform? You just said that you think some of your clients may not actually belong in Guantanamo, um, just hypothetically um, in a more traditional POW camp during World War II. Presumably somebody could argue that a captured um, soldier from the other side, uh, or at least a POW from the other side, maybe shouldn't belong there. Does that person have a right of counsel? And, and what's the principal distinction? So. Uh, let me, uh, there were two, ver I mean, there are two different questions there. Let me take the first one first, right? I, so uh, we, we should be clear, right? The Constitution specifically contemplates a process pursuant to which the political branches can deny detainees access to the courts, right? It's the suspension clause. Um, the purpose of the suspension clause is to literally foreclose judicial review uh, in cases of rebellion or invasion when the public safety may require it. Um, and I think it has to follow from Congress's power to suspend the writ of habeas corpus that Congress can also deny detainees in a case where habeas is properly suspended access to counsel. I mean, I think that that has to go part and parcel. So on the first question, I think the Constitution is quite clear, at least domestically, um, right, the circumstances in which counsel actually can be denied. And I think they're limited to, the, to, to that situation. Um, the harder question, you know, the, 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 the World War II question is always the question that comes up, right? Well, if the Guantanamo detainees get counsel, why wouldn't hundreds of thousands of German POWs during World War II have gotten counsel? Um, and the short answer is, I'm not so sure had it been litigated, the answer would have been they don't get counsel. Um, I think it just would have been that they lose in about, in less time than it takes to say, here's my habeas petition, they lose. Um, right? They lose really quickly, um, and they lose in five seconds on the ground that they were captured on a battlefield by U.S. soldiers during a declared war. Right? Um, the, other critical, you know, the other critical distinction between World War II and today is any German national on U.S. soil during World War II could have been detained under the auspices of the Alien Enemy Act of 1798. We didn't, we didn't even have to show that someone who was a national of Germany was in the German army or was actively engaged in hostilities against the United States in order to detain them. Right, so you know, I think the circumstances are sufficiently different um, that the distinction is, you know, at least based on the nature of the conflict. I mean, I, I don't know if you could have ever had a regime where you would have provided counsel to detainees during World War II, um, but I'll put it this way, right? Every time a case came to the federal courts during World War II, brought by an alien enemy who was being detained, brought by a Nazi soldier who was being subject to a military commission, brought by Japanese soldiers who were tried in military commissions, they had able representation by counsel. Um, and I think that only made those cases, you know, more viable as precedents and not less. Go ahead, Steve. Well, if I'll comment, uh, I think the question didn't go to military commission or other criminal type proceeding, but to a determination that the person is properly detained in the first instance. And, and under the Geneva Conventions, if you're talking about the capture of a foreign enemy combatant overseas in a theater of combat, wh where we could all acknowledge there's a hostilities going on, and it's a foreign combatant who's captured, uh, 
what the Geneva Conventions require is a military determination in the it's Article 4, uh, 5, Article 5 uh, Tribunal, which is a military function to determine the status of that captured individual and that individual not entitled under U.S. Constitution to, uh, to a, a lawyer in connection with that uh, determination. And, uh, I mean, we capture many combatants every day in Afghanistan, and determinations need to be made about the proper disposition for detention purposes. Uh, that's a military, that's a military function. The, the Supreme Court's decision in the Boumediene case having to do with Gitmo and detainees uh, held at Guantanamo <coughs> Uh, Korea is a novel, even the court itself uh, acknowledged it was unprecedented, and creates a situation where you have to look at the circumstances, sort of totality of the circumstances determination about the location, about the nature of the conflict, the detention, et cetera, and raises a lot of question marks about how that right to habeas might apply in detention circumstances outside of Gitmo other other circumstance, facts and circumstances that I think is unfortunate because it creates a lot of question marks and, and uh, lack of lack of certainty. But I think in a traditional theater of combat, open hostility situation for the capture of foreign combatants uh, on the battlefield, uh, I think that situation is very clear. Well, uh, let me just pick it back. I mean, just to go back to something I said before, I think we have to be careful to differentiate between bringing the case in the first place and whether you should win. Right? And I think what, what has complicated the cases after September 11 is that these cases do not resolve themselves. Right? So you know, there was literally no legal basis on which a German POW could have challenged the legality of his detention to, between um, December 8, 1941 and April 21st, 1952. Right? I mean, those were the dates pursuant to, you know, those were the end dates for our detention authority during World War II. There was no basis on which his detention could have been unlawful. The 1929 Geneva Conventions provided nowhere near the kinds of detailed procedural protections uh, to which Steve already alluded. So, you know, I, I think the merits matter. It's one thing to say no access to courts for hundreds of thousands of detainees who can't possibly win. It's another thing to say no access to the courts, um, even though there very well may be cases where these detainees might have won on the merits with judicial review. And I think that's, that's part of the problem with this conversation is that, you know, those are very different contexts to me. Nitsana, did you have a comment on this? Other questions? Yes, sir, right here. Good afternoon. Uh, Samuel Doran. My question is, um, given recent circumstances, uh, stepping up in Afghanistan of, of local uh, authority, uh, the increased use by the Obama administration of drone strikes, which resulted in no prisoners, um, withdrawal f in, in a large measure from Iraq. Do we think that this is a question, and obviously Israel's situation is, is different in terms of security, but do we think that this is a question that's going to be at the forefront of American uh, um, affairs in the coming years, or are we sort of closing a door on this chapter? Well. I'm not exactly sure what the this is, but but let me let me just say I don't think the door is closing. I mean, we th this is the century of the war on terror, and I, I believe the international conflict with terrorist organizations is like Al Qaeda and others is going to continue for the rest of our lifetimes. Um, I don't see the other side. Uh, I, I, anyway, I don't see I don't see the end date of this conflict. Uh, so so clearly on the horizon. So as we withdraw from particular theaters of open hostilities and combat, the questions that S Steve identified continue, will continue to get more and more difficult, obscure. The gray areas will expand. Uh, and the issues of raised by the now acknowledged drone strikes by the United States and the targeted killing of uh, senior terrorist operatives uh, Will co would continue to raise these issues, uh, and will. And uh, so there, there may well be, there have been lawsuits brought challenging those actions of the, uh, of the government, and there may be lawsuits against individual officials, who even lawyers, who, who uh, signed off on the, the legality of this. So I, I do think these issues will continue to percolate. And uh, at bottom, they are created by the novel and ambiguous nature of the conflict with international terrorist organizations. 
And uh, you know, this is the this is the these are the novel questions that have been addressed since the very beginning. When in September of 2001, the government addressed the international law and constitutional law question: Should we declare war on these non-state terrorist organizations, or not? And then, sort of, <laughs> every step of the way since then, these issues have have raised difficult and tricky questions. And they continue to be debated by Steve and others in academia, and they can continue to be confronted by senior officials in the government, including in the Obama administration, who have continued many of the policies. Uh, I'll just say, I mean, I, I agree with just about everything Steve said. The only thing I'll, I'll, I'll add is um, it might be worth, if you haven't seen it, reading uh, Jay Johnson's speech from last Friday. Uh, he gave a speech at Oxford um, where he actually – for the first time, talked quite openly about the very real possibility that, as he put it, there will soon be a tipping point um, where, you know, a sufficiently large majority of the leadership structure of al-Qaeda has been incapacitated um, and where we are withdrawing ground troops from Afghanistan, that the legal calculus may change. Um, but as Steve says, I think that will only put more pressure on the courts, um, right, and on the lawyers in these cases, because I think that will change the dynamics, change, I mean, the reason why the, the, the continued access to counsel to speed at Guantanamo matters is because and only because um, of the possibility that the government's detention authority might change um, as these developments unfold, right? And so I think, you know, I think Steve's right, but I think if there is movement on that front from the executive branch, um, that's only going to increase the pressure on courts and lawyers to resolve the, the, the wind down questions as opposed to the sort of in the middle of hostilities questions. Let me, let me just say, if I can, uh, I have enormous respect for Jay, Jay Johnson, and I uh, think he's been doing a great job. And I see that his comments got a lot of attention in the press. I think what he was saying was he can imagine a time when we can return to purely the law enforcement paradigm in our uh, challenge against al-Qaeda and other international terrorist organizations, in which case uh, – the way we approach the issues will transition back to perhaps the way it was pre-2001, and you can debate whether that's a good policy direction or not, or whether it's realistic. But I don't think he said soon. Maybe he's I, – I, I, well, Soon's a beautifully yeah. ambiguous I word. guess it is, uh, in Anything geological right. time maybe. But um, <laughs> the the of course, the dramatic – consequences of what he was envisioning would include that the drone campaign as founded on the legal opinion or the legal legal basis described by Harold Coe, the legal advisor of the State Department in his speeches and the Attorney General, etc., would cease to be lawful under international law. Uh, it would conceivably be a war crime to conduct targeted uh, strikes to kill uh, uh, individuals in that circumstance. Even, uh, even the self-defense strikes. Well, you could, no, but but our forward-leaning posture in the war on terror, and also in many of the ways we pursue the the goal, the policy goal, and defend the country, uh, would be clearly called into question if you declared unilaterally declared a, a cessation to the conflict as a matter of uh, uh, international law. And uh, that has consequences under the Constitution, has consequences under federal statutes, uh, and would have dramatic consequences across the board. So um, I, I think what he was saying was we can envision, he can envision a time and he could see a path to uh, where and when you might reach that conclusion, but I don't think he was suggesting that we're close to that tipping point today. And uh, personally, I don't. You see what's going on in Syria and Libya and Iraq. Uh, uh, I wouldn't subscribe to the conclusion that Al Qaeda is decimated in a practical sense. So wait, so you're of the view that the AUMF authorizes the use of offensive military force in Syria? I'm not taking a position on that question. <laughs> it's on it. Do you want to get in here? Yeah, yeah just um, uh, a little review of what's going on in Israel because I think um, the Israeli Supreme Court has dealt with these issues long, long before, um, <laughs> unfortunately, it happened in the United States. Um, the question if of targeted killings 
uh, was uh, discussed in the uh, Supreme Court uh, in Israel uh, back then on, uh, in a case that we actually were involved um, in, stood to the right of the uh, government. Um, a, a bomb that was dropped on a building in Gaza where a, a major terrorist from Hamas organization was staying there. And uh, Ize was number two in Hamas, and Israel was uh, trying to uh, get him um, for a very long time. Uh, in the end, they dropped the bomb, and they collapsed the entire building. A lot of Palestinians were, uh, were killed. And the question was raised whether um, it's uh, legal according to the international law to uh, carry out targeted killing. And I remember Israel was condemned and criticized by the United States. Um, I'm saying by the United States because obviously by Europe it was criticized, that's, that's quite clear. <laughs> um, and uh, in the end, the Supreme Court, which is a very, very uh, moral court in Israel, they care very much, the judges there. They uh, are very, very uh, civil rights oriented. Um, came and ruled that um, targeted killing is an essential step that you have to take in the war against terrorism. Uh, you have to be very careful, obviously, and you have to do all the checks before, but you are, um, you have a complete right to uh, carry it out. And I think after uh, the assassination of bin Laden, um, the United States came and used the same argument of the Supreme Court decision, saying that had a right to, um, to kill him. Um, so we are facing a lot of questions of, of civil rights. Um, we have like um, just a quick thing. Um, in Israel, we have a law that says that um, everyone who marries an Israeli can become Israeli. It's easy, right? <laughs> All you have to do is to marry an Israeli. You don't have to live for three years in Israel. You don't have to do anything. As the United States, you get an automatic citizenship. And a lot of uh, Palestinians and a lot of Jordanians, Lebanese people from around us uh, used these clothes, married an Arab Israeli, got citizenship, and then they had freedom to do anything they want to. And during the Intifada, 75% um, of these people who got citizenship came and carried out attacks against uh, Israelis, using their freedom of movement, freedom to do anything they want. To. Um, so the, uh, the, our parliament, the Knesset, came and restricted this uh, provision and said that people from areas as a Palestinian Authority and from enemy states should not have a right to become automatic uh, citizens. Um, and that was a case that was brought before the Supreme Court because the uh, organizations who brought it up came and said that the, the uh, Knesset discriminates between Arabs and uh, other people. And I can tell you it was a major, major uh, issue, it, the uh, Supreme Court said, in the largest panel ever. Um, they had a couple of uh, hearings and new hearings about it, and in the end, they came and uh, voted on one vote, I mean it was six to five, um, <laughs> leaving this restriction uh, standing. And uh, the famous sentence of uh, today Chief Justice was that um, civil rights is a not a recipe for suicide meaning Israel on one hand has to keep the civil rights, the human rights of their enemies. On the other hand, they should not uh, keep it in a sense that we sacrifice our security, our life, in order to preserve these human rights. Other questions? Okay, well let's take 60 seconds each maybe just to uh, express any final thoughts, wrap up, and we'll go in the order we went uh, initially, Steve Bradbury. Okay, I don't really have a lot uh, to add. I think we've had a good discussion. Um, I would just stress again, I actually uh, agree with almost everything that both of the others on the panel have said, and uh, uh, in particular, I think I said it before, but I'll stress it again. Um, I'm, I do not question at all the patriotism uh, or integrity of the lawyers who represent detainees in the, in the war on terror, and I do think that they have, I agree with Steve that they have uh, their actions and the and the, the legal actions they brought 
have resulted in advances in terms of our legal doctrine and legal understanding. I don't agree with some of the Supreme Court decisions at the end of the day, uh, but um, the I think the process has been a very healthy one, ultimately. And it was painful. It's been painful in many respects, but uh, from the vantage of 11 years after 9-11, looking back, I, I, uh, I think this has been an extremely important time in the history of the country and in our understanding of uh, some of these international legal principles and uh, will be a time that will be written about for, for a long time to come. And I think a lot of lessons, uh, which we haven't fully learned yet, will be learned uh, as the decades unfold. Um, but the war is not over. Um, so I think, I, I think there's a tendency in commentary these days, anytime you get there's a judicial decision you don't agree with, there's a tendency on on the on the part of the folks who dis, dis, who disagree with that decision to um, question the power of the court to have handed down the decision in the first place, right? So um, there's no such thing as just being wrong anymore. Right now it has to be now, now everything that's wrong is lawless, um, and I think that's counterproductive, right? I think I think nuance matters in these conversations, um, and I think the exact that's the exact kind of nuance that I think the the three of us all share, right? Which is there's an enormous difference between saying you shouldn't win and saying you have no business even bringing these cases in the first place. Um, and, and I get very nervous um, any time the conversation sounds more like the latter um, because it assumes that we can make judgments in advance about none of these cases being meritorious. Um, and if, if, if the last 10 years have taught us anything, I mean, I agree with Steve on some of the lessons we've learned. I think it's also taught us that the government even when acting in the best of intentions, will make mistakes. Um, and part of the purpose of private lawyers is to call the government to account when it makes mistakes. Um, and you know, without the ability to do so, there will be less incentive for the government to not make mistakes, um, which is hopefully something we should all uh, uh, want to avoid, no matter who's the government at the time we make that statement. Ms. Anna. Um, well, all I can uh, say is uh, to use this room and to call all the lawyers to uh, join the uh, role, to join the fight against terrorism, not only in, in, in Israel, in the United States and elsewhere. I think that um, governments are lacking the ability to fight uh, in the uh, civil sector, as civil lawyers can do. Um, and I know that there are a lot of creative lawyers, a lot of initiative lawyers, a lot of lawyers that can take this battle. And uh, our organization just proves that uh, if you are creative enough, courageous enough, um, and uh, not afraid to file any sort of lawsuit, uh, eventually you can be very effective. You can win because this is what we need to do now. We need to win the terrorists. Well, thank you to the audience for joining us today, and please uh, join me in thanking our panel for an excellent discussion. <laughs>